All right. So today we have uh, the filmmakers and the star of Walk with Frank. It's a beautiful documentary uh, about a Vietnam War veteran that walks across New York State to help others, uh, other survivors of post-traumatic stress while confronting his own dark past. Walk with Frank is a film about self-discovery, mental health, and a truly honest look at how post-traumatic stress and mental health impacts our society. And I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm so honored to have you, Frank Romeo, uh, Matt Mayers, Ryan Mayers. Uh, it's such an honor to have you here. And your documentary is beautiful. The, the way that Frank uh, just uncovers his whole process of healing, his past, meeting other people on this journey is just so beautifully done. So I just, I want to thank you and just uh, tell you that I'm, I'm so honored to have you here. Welcome. Honor, Sarah. It's our honor to be here. Um, and it's a story that, um, that we know, you know, so many people are impacted by, whether it's uh, the post-trauma aspect of it or just mental health in general. Um, we hope to be able to add something to the conversation and to hope, help uh, break the stigma of talking about it. And I think too, I think what we were talking about before is uh, Frank just would love for this to be a conversation style time that um, if you want to share, we'll just follow your lead and we'll, you know, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or pop in or whatever you'd like to do in this conversation. So what we were thinking of doing is uh, maybe showing a clip from the film. Um, and uh, that clip hopefully will spark the conversation and hopefully everybody will feel free to ask a question, like Sarah said, if, if there's something you wanna ask or something on your mind. So you wanna start with a clip, we'll show a, a clip of the film um, and uh, go from there. That sound good? Sounds fantastic. All right. Taking that first step and saying, I have mental illness. I've now crossed the line. There's no turning back here. Because when you say it out loud, you hear it for yourself. When you say it to yourself and not out loud, it's still in your head. You know, it's a struggle. The demons are all at it. And sometimes you're the observer and you're watching the battle rage, good and bad, right and wrong. Suicide, non-suicide, should I talk about it? Should I just keep quiet? Should I take meds and just pass out and go to sleep so I don't have to visually watch that bad commercial repeat itself? I mean, I think we need to understand how we got here. It's almost like, how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've been? Was everybody able to see that? I so the, yeah. So the yeah. yeah, the idea is um, you know, that that's one of the, the opening scenes in the film. And and um, you know, what we always talk about with Frank is the fact that a lot of people that aren't veterans or that don't deal with post trauma don't really understand what it's all about. And um, you know, I, I don't know if you want to talk about it, Frank, a little bit about what uh what post trauma is and what you know, how you've kind of struggled with it through the years. Well, the main, uh, the opening scene, that was the opening scene. There's a little more to it before that. Uh, the opening scene was, was basically uh, taking that first step. I mean, on the walk and, and, and you guys filmed it. I mean, so many people just were, they needed to get that, take that first step. And taking that first step was, was like the most important thing in their life. And for me, it was 30 years before I took my first step. Uh, through uh, drug and alcohol abuse and, and prison. And, and uh, you know, like it says in, I was talking about, it was in my head and getting it out and saying it out loud. And then we get into the whole concept of, of actually saying it out loud and, and, and attacking, just by simply talking about it, we're attacking the stigma of post-trauma. 
and um, in, in the beginning, um, when you get to see the film, in the beginning, we're, we're talking with veterans and we, we're, they're coming forward. They felt comfortable. Um, uh, I'm not a doctor or a clinician. I'm, I'm one of them and, and suffering myself. And they felt a little more comfortable just opening up. And in the shelters, when we lived in, uh, I lived in the shelters with the, the, the veterans, um, they, were, they were more than willing. They, they wanted me to hear their story. Um, I gave them a voice and we gave them a voice by, by making the documentary. We gave them a voice to take that first step. And, it was, and it's just so vital and I cannot emphasize it. Um, uh, you know, in Bastards Row and, and, and talking about it and getting people to take that first step. It, it's just the hardest thing, yet it's the most crucial step of all is step one. We, I think we felt by starting the film that way was sort of like ripping that Band-Aid off quick for people like, look, this is OK. Like, you know, we're going, going to go into a deep dive here into what this means. But that starts with just honestly, you know, admitting it to yourself, admitting it to others and taking that step. And it's OK. Well, the other thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, the idea of it, like Matt said, is just being able to talk about it and for Frank to, I mean, that, that, that seems part of, uh, you know, Frank's uh, departure when he, um, he admitted, you know, to, to, to a public audience that I have uh, PTSD. Uh, what was it like for you, Frank? I mean, when you, when you first had to, had to say that, or when you first, you know, admitted it well, to, to the public? We didn't, we did we cut out the beginning part of that. Right. Like, right. I, I broke down in tears. So I'm, I'm uh, the city of Buffalo was at, just welcomed us with open arms. And that was the uh, Buffalo Erie County Naval Park uh, Museum that, that I'm walking out of. And the museum was full of people and the press was there and the media was there. And uh, we're starting on this journey, this, this old man walking, you know, 750 miles in the snow and, and the rain and everything. And so we're starting out and yet that was irrelevant. What was relevant was, you know, taking that saying, look, you know, I have an issue. I have a problem. And and so I'm doing this because I have a problem. I'm not doing this to to, you know, self and, and you know, grandizement. Uh, I'm doing this because I have an issue and here's my issue. And uh, I, I totally uh, I'm breaking down now. Uh, I totally broke down on the podium and uh, my wife came up and she hugged me. And um, I started my journey. And I think the ease and honesty in which Frank's able to do that, like he said, is was able to allow us to get just such open, honest conversations with people that were just willing to sh share their stories because Frank was willing to listen to them and share his. What we, uh, when we initially started out, what started out to be PTSD and veterans morphed into a mental health movement by the time I reached New York City. I mean, people, people just walked into our, our, our sites, our, our, our shooting. We, we, would, we would set up a scene and, you know, and with other veterans at, at a memorial or something, and people would just walk in and start talking uh, just randomly and, and wanting to, for me to, or us to hear their story. And it was all, it was all post-trauma. It, it seems like we need this. We need People maybe don't know how to do it. They don't know how to say it out loud. And this gives them a vehicle. This, this shows them, yes, it's hard. We all know it's hard. I know it's hard. Um, but to, to get them to give them a platform and say, okay, let's hear your story. And you, you meet the most amazing people on this film that just want to just wanna talk. Uh, you know, they just want to take that. And there was a contagious aspect to it, like Frank said, like we'd be standing in a circle. And I think people saw that and just that that feeling of I have something inside that I, too, want to share that's relevant to all these guys that are talking and sharing made people want to be go over there and be a part of that. And, you know, we kind of we kind of try to take that idea, that philosophy and use that in the film and how the story progressed and how the people kind of came out of the woodwork sharing, like Frank said, not stories just about war or whatever, but just trauma in their lives that they haven't talked about ever. Um, so we just started seeing how much bigger this was of an issue and how many more people we can touch and, and make understand you know, what people are going through. Yeah. And, and people actually started their conversation with, I never said this before. Yep. I, I've, I've never spoken these words before. And 
So the, and and they start talking to me and sharing for the first time in their lives some of these mo the most amazing stories, um, heartfelt stories, you know, uh, gut wrenching stories. Um, but it it became an outlet, uh, and the walk itself became an outlet, and and now hopefully the the documentary will be an outlet for for people to step forward step out of out of that that zone and you know into that uncomfortable area and, and give them uh, an outlet give them a voice and and uh, and see where it leads so when we when we reached rochester um, there was a large stretch there between buffalo and rochester that was really desolate you know there was a <laughs> right right how do you describe that area of western new york Western, there's no place like Western New York. Uh, my only comfort was the snow and the 80 mile an hour winds from the Arctic vortex. It was we got below zero. The Niagara River was frozen. Niagara Falls was frozen. Um, and, and people say, well, well, why'd you start then? A lot of students were following this as a lesson plan throughout America. So we had not only were reaching veterans, but I'm introducing New York State high school students to New York State homeless veterans, and you know on a daily blog and daily pictures, and and uh, Matt and Ryan would touch them up and make them look professional, but they were really just you know my little selfie videos, and um, and and so you know it took on a life of its own. But Western New York, there's nothing in Western New York. Buffalo is like the last outpost as far as I'm concerned. And it's not, I mean, you have some physical, you know, issues as well. You know, you're 70 and it's not like uh, it was an easy <laughs> walk, right? What, what are some of the things that you were dealing with? Well, <laughs> that, well I was a young man then. I was seven. I was seven. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, that was three years ago. <laughs> I'm right. an old man now. But uh, I was young then, so it didn't bother me. <laughs> but, uh, I have uh, I have prosthetics. Uh, you know, my I've been shot up numerous times. I have a bullet in my spine. Uh, it's caused nerve damage. Uh, you know, I have artificial knees and, and things. So, uh, you know, the cold went right through me and, and, uh, but you know, it, it's part of the trauma, you know, you make it a part of you. And, and I talk about this in the film is, is, you know, um, you make the physical pain a part of you, you embrace it. And that's, that's how I approach PTSD. And when I, when I lecture, and I talk to young veterans, especially, um, I, I try to get them, uh, you know, not to fight it. Don't fight it. Don't, don't think you're going to get cured. Embrace it. Learn from it. Learn about yourself. Learn about your triggers. Learn, learn who you are. And by learning more about yourself, um, you'll feel more comfortable within your own skin and, 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 and embrace your own post-trauma. It's a part of you. It's not going away. You have it forever. You know, and, and so, you know, you might as well learn to live with it. Um, and that's been my approach. I've been teaching PTSD classes now for 30 years, long before it became popular and vogue. Long before people knew the word PTSD, I was traveling around the country on my own, uh, sleeping in my van and uh, talking to anyone who would talk to me. Uh, any high schools would let me in and, uh, and teaching post-trauma. And this is the culmination of that. Frank made a good point that I'd like to add on too. like, you know, there was a lot of different aspects of this film, you know, he was walking to sort of, you know, bring attention to his cause. He this educational curriculum that he was implementing across the state. So part of the film was actually stopping, you know, actually getting him doing these lectures and presentations that were going on, you know, week long events at these schools that we'd pop in for a day and get him speaking. Um, and it morphed. I mean, a lot of things changed along the way as far as like what the story was going to be when we started to what it ended up being. Um, but one of those things that became about like talking about being broadening out of being more than just veterans, more about just mental health. Um, we did notice this thing about just understanding. Like it seems like when people are more open to talking to each other about who the other person next to them are and who they are and kind of sharing stories, there's this kind of like togetherness that happened that where all these, you know, in this time of divisiveness, all those kind of like petty differences sort of melt away. And we realize that we're more alike than we are different. And I feel like that there's a broader message there that I think is really important right now. And I think, you know, in the way that Frank approaches, you know, his mental illness and physical illnesses and just, you know, diver you know adversity in his life, I think, helped inspire people to sort of, you know, 
let's, you know, find out what's going on with that person next to me before I make that quick judgment. And I know it certainly did for Ryan and I, you know, just changed the way we approach everything we do, I think now, after, after doing this project and seeing, seeing how people were inspired by it. So. And, and, and also, you know, Matt and I aren't veterans. So giving us a, a kind of a, an inside look as to what a veteran is dealing with, um, it was really an amazing thing. And, and, and the fact that we're all surrounded by veterans. I mean, everyone has veterans in their community, whether they're in your family or just, you know, friends. And, you know, it's that idea of just starting a conversation, you know, asking the veteran questions. Uh, it's more than, um, you know, just acknowledging their service and thanking them, but just, you know, don't be afraid to ask the question or, or just get into that conversation. And, I think and a lot of that is just that willingness of you to open up and just want to hear somebody, you know, sometimes just doing that, just pushing yourself to take that step opens you up to so many opportunities to people you're going to meet that you might not have talked to that can bring so much to your life. I mean, you know, we saw it just in the three months, four months we walked, we've seen it in the, in the two years since we've done the walk and all the people that have helped us. And, you know, like we're doing today, I mean, you know, to me, this is what it's all about is making these connections. And I think we found the one thing that the thing that the people who suffer the most lack is that personal connection. So to us, the more they can make that connection, the more they're, you know, feeling a part of something. And to me, that's what it's all about. We talked about, um, we talked about people saying, thank you for your service. And well, what comes next? You know, it's almost an uncomfortable point. And a non-veteran would, would go up to a veteran and say, well, thank you for your service. Well, why not ask something beyond that instead of just walking away? Why not say, you know, how are you? Or, or you know, you know, tell me about it. Or, or you know, the, it's almost, you're almost uncomfortable by saying, you know, thank you for your service. Because, you know, sometimes it's better that you not say it unless you're going to continue that conversation instead of just walking away. And, and we're trying to break that stigma. We're trying to get people to open up. We're trying to uh, tear down. Guard. It's just dropping their guard and getting rid of the yeah. fear, asking yeah. that question, you know? Yeah. Where were you? Where'd you serve? You know, man, that must have been crazy. Anything. You know, Anything. like just, just being heard, I feel like just, you know, makes such a difference in these people's lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so going off of that, we, 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 uh, we reached Rochester and um, there was a place called Richard's House, which was an amazing shelter that uh, was kind of a, what, what do they call it, Frank? A um, transition home. Transition home. So it was a place for veterans who were trying to get jobs and they could stay at Richard's house for a, a short amount of time. And um, we have a clip from that. You want to play that clip and then we could talk about Richard's house? Yeah, just let me say one thing before you turn it on. There, yeah. there were three basic shelters that I stayed in. There was the immediate shelter, get the, get get them off the street. And that happened, I I... I was involved with that when the uh, the storm came, the Arctic vortex hit, and it was immediately get them off the street. That's one shelter. Then there's the transition home where a veteran is permitted to stay for a, a period of time. He has to be clean and sober. He has to be working towards a goal, um, and he has to show some effort. And then there's the permanent residence. So I, I stayed in dozens of them, but a variety of different kinds. This one is a transition home. This is Richard's house. And to me, this was the crown jewel of every place I visited uh, and every shelter I stayed in. The idea is, is to get my life squared away. I've, I'm in school right now for nursing. Um, I also do the resident advisor position here, which is really kind of cool, helping out where the rules need to be enforced, but also helping out the guys as far as, you know, you know, taking, taking care of them, taking care of their needs, that type of thing. So you had a muscle one day and mom the next day? Uh, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I'm more the muscle, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if they get hurt or if they need anything, it's like, hey, where's Doc? We had a guy the other day, he had an interview for a job, and um, Doc took all of his clothes, ironed them out for him. If he had a button missing, he sewed his button on for him, and he got him ready to go out the door, you know? And uh, right here, he's got a sewing machine. He just bought it. It's awesome because this spot right here, we turned it into, you know, it was empty space, and we turned it into, you know, a sewing machine, an ironing, um, I mean, basically fabric repair, fix and go. It's really awesome. Well, this place is a consequence over our heads. If you drink or drug and, you, and you're caught, all right, then you find the road. Yeah. And I like that consequence. I like it too. Yeah. It makes me think. 
because right now, honestly, right now everything is going great. Yeah. The main reason that uh, everything went to crap is the deployment to Iraq and some of the things I did there as a medic. And uh, so I came back and um, started having bad nightmares and that type of thing. And uh, I was too stupid to go to the VA and get it checked out because I was like, oh, it's just part of the deal, you know. Never even thought about PTSD, I just thought, oh, I saw a lot of bad stuff. And I was actually still, as a paramedic on the street, still seeing the same stuff. So um, I started drinking to sleep, self-medicating. And I did that from 2006 through all the way up to 2013. Now, it wasn't as bad until like the end of it, but I went through two marriages. Um, I just got my kids back in my life. It's been rough. Yeah, we, we met so many great people in Richard's house. And uh, it, it was amazing to hear those stories. Um, you know, Doc was just one of the people that we met. And, and I know you stayed in touch with him. You know, what, what were your experiences in Richard's house, Frank? Richard's house, um, as I said, to me, was an amazing place. Um, so 30, 30, 30 homeless veterans come together every night for dinner. They sit down for dinner. They share dinner. They help each other cook dinner. They clean up uh, as a family unit. And and getting back, you know, getting back to post trauma and and embracing it and the family unit. This was their family unit. They came together every night as a family. So you know, I have a I have a large family. My family embraces my post trauma. But to them, this is, was their family. And to see them come together as a unit, as a family unit, every night and help each other is amazing. You have one, you have one veteran, uh, homeless veteran, ironing the clothes of another homeless veteran. I mean, think about it. He's sewing buttons on. You know, uh, they're helping each other. And to see that and, and to stay there um, was just, it just blew me away, uh, the camaraderie. Um, you know, they didn't have to do that. They could just be there and just, you know, tend to themselves, mind their own business, um, keep themselves clean and, and have a place to stay. But they chose, they chose to help each other. And I saw it time and again in the time I stayed there. They chose to help each other uh, because they had a common, a common goal. They had a common cause. And, and each one was homeless. And each one had some level of PTSD. We interviewed, I don't know how many, uh, homeless there, how many veterans there, and um, underlying every issue was a, a traumatic event. Underlining every issue, every veteran was that post-trauma surrounding them, and and they're trying to find their way, and uh, they opened up. I mean, they just began talking. Uh, we couldn't film enough. We honestly yeah. couldn't film it. They just yeah. wanted to talk. And and just, me, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the veterans issues came from coming after, you know, stemmed from them not being able to adjust after that, you know, where things got worse. And that's where their tr real trauma came from was either, you know, having like maybe, you know, traumatic events with family or things like that. So it was really interesting to see the um, just the, the, the cause and effects throughout, not just the, the person affected, but how it affects their family and, and people they know them and just this whole, you know, this. Uh, spread of, of this infectious disease. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that, um, you know, we, there was another uh, person that we met named Kevin and there was a clip in the film, but it, it wasn't in that clip. Um, Frank and I were, uh, we were getting ready to go to bed. It was, you know, we were tired and this, uh, this guy came out and he was making himself a snack. And to be honest, you know, he was a big guy and he looked a little intimidating. We started talking to him and it was, you know, he, he sat down and connected with Frank and you know, he was in tears telling his story. And it, for me, it was just uh, eye-opening seeing how um, not only do people have these stories inside of them that they want to share, but, you know, not to judge someone based on what you think they look like or what you think they are, because uh, everybody has a story inside. And it's, it's kind of amazing once they start to share it, you learn about that person. And so also to what Frank was saying, or Ryan mentioned about Doc sort of like staying in touch with us, you know, we, we kept a relationship with him and he ended up going to some schools and speaking with Frank 
Um, you know, and it was part of the philosophy of, you know, and the walk was walk with Frank. We called the film walk with Frank because the to us to walk with Frank became a philosophy. It was these people along the way weren't just people we met and then left. It was people that really joined us in our family and our mission and moving along. So, you know, Doc, we stayed in touch with and, you know, speaking to that guy, Kevin, like some of these people, like some of them did, are, are working out great. Some of them not so great. You know, we followed up with a lot of them during, during the, uh, the pandemic when that started and we followed up with Doc. And interviewed him on a podcast actually asking about some of the guys that we met that um that it did, did end up getting kicked out of the house since then um things not working out well you know so for us it's really personal when you when you do have an evening like that with guys and you make that personal connection and then you find out that you know they're not doing so good you know it's not every story's a happy ending it just makes us want to push even more to try to help as many people as we can when when we when we did the podcast with doc and uh, he he went through uh, and told us what was going on there. And we had lost one of the, our interviewees, uh, one, one of the veterans hung himself um, during the pandemic. And, you know, and then, and then you get into this whole concept, you know, they're homeless. Now we've locked down the homeless during the pandemic. We've knocked down, we've locked down mental health. We've locked down, you know, child abuse, drug, drug abuse. We, we've locked down all these different things. We're taking it to the next level now, you know? And, and so, a film like this, Ambassador's Row, is a, a terrific film, and and you know, it's timely. You know, we we need this. We need to. We need so importantly to get this message out. I've been I've been trying to get this message out for thirty years. Finally, you know, as an old man, I said, "Well, this is my last chance. I'm going to walk across the state. Maybe somebody will pay attention to me." But it, it just you know was serendipitous that now more than ever we need this. We need to get this message out. Yeah, and you have to picture us fi finishing filming this and then, you know, trying to talk about how to start post-production and then this whole pandemic rolls in and everyone's on the news talking about, you know, the mental health of our children, about, like Frank said, all these programs that are being shut down and it just got us like, you know, this is like, you know, the timing is great for, for these kind of programs. You know, unfortunately, they're needed more than ever, but hopefully that'll help, you know, help what we're trying to do here. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, um, but out of all the shelters, uh, Richard's house was really uh, totally inspirational. And Doc was an amazing person. And, and uh, I flew Doc from Rochester down to Long Island and he stayed for a week doing workshops. So a homeless veteran is now teaching high school students and doing workshops on post-trauma, you know, that's that's important. That's so that connection right there says it all. That he he needed that. He needed to do that. And, and the students needed think, to hear it. Someone from your perspective, you know, seeing it through the Vietnam War and going through what you did, and then someone from Doc's perspective in Iraq as a as a um, a combat medic, you know, it's two different generations, two different perspectives. And then these kids, I'm sure, are connected to someone they know, an uncle, a mother, or sister, right. whoever it is, you know. Right. right. This is um, this is really the story of PTSD because I'm so old. You know, we start we start with clips from the '60s and and we and we talk about you know how veterans were treated in the '60s. We talk about the VA healthcare system in the '60s and we bring it up and then and the story is timeless. It, it you know you could take this story and use it to to talk about a Civil War soldier you know, and Iraq and Afghanistan and tomorrow's war, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to follow this same story and we're going to follow Bastard's Rose story and we're going to take it, you know, and, and it could be told and it could be used in any generation. It's human, it's the human spirit that we're talking about and, and post-trauma being a part of the human spirit. And that's how I approach it. I approach it as part of us, that it's, that it's inbred in us. It's not something to fight. It's something to embrace and learn from. And that's kind of this concept, the story that that we're that evolves and unfolds throughout this journey. So, Frank, like Richard's house, they, they treated each other like family. But, you know, I know that, you know, from a personal perspective, how your family was affected by, you know, how many kids did you have? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> so let's show a clip from uh, the family day. <laughs> And oh, that, no. that, was the, that, that was the day that your family showed up <laughs> to walk with you on the walkway across the Hudson. Okay. Um, so let me show this clip and we can talk about how families are affected. Thank you all for coming. 
It's a very special day. Um, I get a little choked up. This is family day. PTSD and mental illness is contagious. If someone in the family suffers, the entire family suffered. So my family is here. They're, they're embracing me. And we have to make it a common conversation. And I would like for you all to join me in walking into the city of Poughkeepsie on my journey. Eastbound lane is to your right. Right of the cones, eastbound lane. Please for grandpa. You're walking with grandpa. I can recall times where he has gotten very angry. My father got so angry that he um, took this very large, you know, we're a big Italian family, we got pasta and, you know, um, at every meal. And I can remember a time where he took this big bowl of bouillabaisse, so it was red and there were meatballs and there was fish and he slammed it and then all the pasta and sauce and bouillabaisse went all over us and then he locked us outside. And so we're in white shirts and pasta sauce and meatballs and, you know, spaghetti hanging out of our heads and we often thought that this is who we are, this is what we look like. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. What did I do? Oh, my eye out. Okay, but I'll pie. Yeah. I'm short. I used to go somewhere where someone would be. We look back on it now and we laugh about it and that's the way our family is about, you know, things that he was going through. Come, come, snuggle in with me. <laughs> Keep me warm. He was open about his feelings towards us and, and affectionate and there was always a hug and a kiss. But he could have a temper, an explosive temper. My sister and I would have this sort of little inside joke like, did dad get all Vietnam on you? Um, and for us, that meant, did he get to that explosive point? So, uh, you know, I know that, um, you know, Frank Jr. and Marie and, and all, your, all your kids really opened up with us about some of the struggles that, you know, you guys had in your family growing up. And, you know, I know you always talk, Frank, how PTSD is contagious and how it affects the entire family. Um, what are some of your thoughts about, um, you know, some of your thoughts about how, how it affected your family? When, when I suffered and I had these, these outbursts of anger, uh, I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't control myself. Uh, I was angry and I didn't know why. And, 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 you know, I, I, I lashed out and I became violent and I didn't know why. And, and so when I suffered, my wife suffered and, 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 she eventually left me. And, and so, you know, when, when I suffered, my children suffered and, you know, and I let them, I let them speak. There was no holding back. And uh, there's, there's interviews like that throughout, throughout the film um, with my family, my brother, my younger brother and how he, I treated him and how I treated my mother when I came home and, and the violent outbursts. So these are important issues to talk about because um, we're a loving family. We've come together. Um, we've healed. Um, they were all part of the journey. Um, but w the, these are the things we need to talk about. There are, there are veterans out there, um, that are struggling with their, their marriages and their children. And, and so we're, we're now, you know, we have the longest war. Vietnam was the longest war in history until Iraq and Afghanistan. And now it's just like 20 years. So you have, you have the children of veterans actually fighting in the same war as their parents, you know, if you think about it. And so this is a whole generation, not just of, of soldiers and veterans. This is their children. This is their children now, a whole generation of their children for 20 years that are now going to move forward carrying you know, some of that baggage. And, and so these, these interviews are important. Um, they're hurtful uh, in a way that I, I feel terrible of some of the things I did. Um, but it's more important, you know, putting the, my feelings aside, it's more important to get the message out and to talk about it and to let younger veterans know 
I know you're struggling. I know your children are struggling. I know your wife is struggling, you know, and, and I know there's outlets for them and there's counseling for them, but you know, it, it, it doesn't take the place of that, the touch. It doesn't take the place of that, that, you know, that hug, you know, in the family unit. Um, it, it can never take the place of that. And, um, and so we show that we, un, we unravel that with the family as, as the movie progresses. And we don't hold back with any of the, any of the uh, trauma or bad things or, or, or anything. We let it out. And eventually, you know, you were able to come through, you know, make it at least uh, past some of that suffering. And for you, Frank, uh, you know, we, we, we have a clip here talking about how art how, how art was the outlet. Um, and I, I just want to say before you play the yeah. clip, I think, I think speaking to Frank's kids and being part of this film, this process, making this film and being on this walk helped them work through some things and come to terms with some things. So like Frank says, he's got seven kids. I mean, every veteran out there has got how many kids, how many brothers, sisters, you know, and all these people have stuff to work stuff out. So. And, uh, and, and, and these, <laughs> and these interviews with my children were done on the walk. All interviews were done on this walk. There was no studio time. They all sat down, you know, uh, uh, took time off from the walk whenever they could join me and they were interviewed by Matt and Ryan. And so, you know, it was all part of this energy, amazing energy, just floating across New York state from Buffalo, you know, 750 miles down to long Island. There was this amazing energy that built and we, it started building momentum and started building momentum. And, and besides total strangers talking and coming into our shoot, uh, my children would just start telling stories. Uh, too many stories for them to record and put in a film. The film could have been two and a half hours long. Just we all when, it felt, when it was done, we all felt that everyone involved had moved forward and started healing in some way in yeah. their own way. And we just felt like, you know, how can this be a bad thing? <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. So let me share this last clip and then we can, we can maybe open it up to questions and comments. Um, this one shows uh, how art impacted Frank's life. I remember for Christmas, you know, you always get dad like Old Spice or ties or, you know, these things. And one year he asked for an easel and some paint and stuff. And we're all just like, you don't even help us with homework. Like, what, what do you mean you need this? And he's like, I don't know. I just got to feel, feel the urge to paint something. And I remember coming home and he had painted something that I just didn't think he had the ability. And when I asked him about it, he's like, I don't even know where it came from. It was just something that I saw. And as he's telling me this, I'm thinking to myself, like, what's in there? What's inside there? Uh, what are things that I don't know? I never forget my first painting. I was crying. And I sat there, and I, I was reliving the day I got shot. And I had tears in my eyes. I was shaking all over. And I began going through all the stories. And with each story came a painting and I began to welcome it and understand it and let it out, the dam had burst. Some of my friends committed suicide when the dam burst and I, you know, I found art. Once he showed us these paintings, once he showed us this glimpse, what he did was open us up, open himself up for us to ask him questions, right? So we got to hear his story and I think that that's how he's started to heal himself on this journey and then how he's helped to heal the family. Finally, we're able to kind of get to some of the sensitive side and sensitive things that you have inside you that have there. And like you said, that they were either shoved, shoved down or pushed aside or swept under the rug um, and not able really to get in touch with it. And so that's what I think part of this journey has allowed you to do is get in touch with your yeah, true absolutely. self. Absolutely. Thanks for joining me on mm -hmm. my journey. Thank you. I love you. Very much. I love you. And then I thought, wow, this is important. The world needs to understand what I've discovered. I was documenting the emotional history of our country. This is art therapy as we know it today. 
So, uh, you know, I guess maybe talk briefly about the art and then, you know, I, I want to open it up if everybody has uh, questions or thoughts or comments. Um, but go ahead, Frank, you maybe talk about um, what, uh, what the art meant to you. The art, uh, I used to, I used to um, when I found art and I discovered art, it was probably the lowest a low point in my life. I had just been diagnosed with PTSD. So this is now the early 90s. So since 19, the end of the 60s, I've been diagnosed as being depressed, depressive neurosis. So for 30 years, the VA has been treating me with, with depression drugs for 30 years. So this is the beginning now, finally, you know, through, through Vietnam veterans, um, the red flag going up for 30 years, the American Psychiatric Association steps in and they say, you know, the red flag went up enough times. Now we have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's, this is the evolution of post-trauma. And so finally something makes sense to me. And with that, I discovered art. And, and, and along the way, I lost a lot of my friends committing suicide. And with that, I found art. And one thing led to another. In the beginning, I wouldn't show anyone my, my art. Now, the Vietnam veteran was was um, conditioned, you know, we weren't welcomed home, we were spit on. And, and so I wasn't, I wasn't conditioned to show my feelings. So I hid my artwork away. And when it was discovered, I was dubbed the closet artist. And finally, my artwork came out. And, and, you know, it, it took on a life of its own. So um, my artwork went to Chicago and was the beginning of what now is known as the National Veterans Art Museum. And, and so I'm part of the permanent collection. So this artwork that we show in the film is the beginning stages of a national museum now. And, and so it's a learning museum and, and, um, and I'm proud to be a, a part of that, but uh, the artwork got me through. And once I discovered how important was, it was, like I said before, I packed my art in, in the van and I would sleep in the van next to my art because I didn't have any money and I would travel around the country and I would approach school districts and, and, and anyone who would listen to set up my artwork and start talking about PTSD. And that was over 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, this is the culmination of that. Um, so that, that's what art, art helped me to, to, it was my journal. It was my diary, my personal diary. And, um, and instead of words, I made pictures. And just as a quick follow up about how that led to really this walk was, you know, Frank eventually um, through traveling decided this was helping him, you know, uncover, you know, help, it was helping him heal by doing this traveling, educating uh, students about it, and eventually ended up going back to Vietnam, documenting the whole process through a blog and through um, uh, was Skyping with students in classrooms, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is what inspired him to take this on the road across New York State as part of a curriculum, sort of like taking this idea of traveling, documenting his journey. And as you saw in the clip with Doc, he's kind of filming with his phone. Frank's whole thing is documenting what he's doing, even if there's not a camera crew there. So, you know, part of the filmmaking process was taking some of those elements of Frank documenting his point of view of things and putting that into the film so people can sort of see, you know, how he, what his thoughts are when he's alone in bed at night or waking up early in the morning after a night of bad sleep. My, so my camera, that, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, my, my camera was always on. I was always videoing myself and talking about my personal feelings. And then I, when I went back to Asia and, and I slept in grass huts all over again, I slept in rice paddies. I, I went back into the jungle where I was, I was ambushed. Um, and I, I shared my feelings then as a young man and now as an old man in the transition. And students in America followed me as a lesson plan. And I, I, I realized that reality-based education approach uh, seemed to work. Students, you know, infused into mainstream curriculum. And I developed a, a curriculum called the Experience of the American Soldier, which is reality-based, where in each community in, in New York State can bring in their hometown veterans as part of the curriculum, as part of the learning process. And, and uh, I share letters. We, 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 I have a collection of letters from the Civil War right up throughout Iraq and Afghanistan. And we share soldiers' letters in this curriculum along with the artwork, which speaks for itself. I mean, you know, you look at some of this artwork and you don't, not just mine, I mean, the whole museum. 
and you don't need me to lecture. You just, students walk through the exhibit and they go, you know, whoa, you know, it, it, some of it's very, very powerful. I'd love, love to leave some time for a question and check yeah. questions if anybody has any thoughts or wants to ask a question or just add something from their experience. I just want to thank you. Um, uh, it, you know, Ryan and Matt, your empathy is, is beautiful. It chokes me up that you've presented this beautiful documentary. Um, Frank, your and, and your thoughts, Frank Romero, uh, Romeo, I always want to say Romero, it is um, your story and your insight and your willingness to share so deeply is so powerful. I, I have a feeling I'm talking for everybody, but I think everybody should see this and hear this conversation. Um, I had two thoughts very quickly. Um, you know, the language is changing post-traumatic stress disorder to injury. And when you think about that, an injury, an injury while you're in combat, an injury in anything, it would be like somebody shoots you and you keep putting on a Band-Aid because you're not getting the help that you need. And our brains and our, get injured with post-traumatic stress. And you think, of course, people are drinking. Of course, they're taking drugs. Of course, they're yelling at their you know, families or having blow-ups because they're not healed yet. And as somebody else posted on LinkedIn, Jen Satterley, she said, who is a, 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 just a rock star advocate uh, for our veterans and for anybody with post-traumatic stress, when we can see it as an injury, then the conversation changes. It needs healing. Then we can see it. It's not about a weakness or confusion. It's about, oh, I'm injured, you know? And, um, and I love too your point about how powerful having a conversation is. Isn't this part of healing that injury is being able to hear everybody's stories and be heard. And you think about, isn't this like another Navy SEAL said on one of these talks, isn't this the antidote? Isn't You're absolutely right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And when you talk about the yeah. injury, we have no problem talking about, oh, I had a broken arm, I had to go to the doctor, or even a gunshot wound or something like that, people would be open to talk about. But cancer, people wear ribbons for different cancers and other illnesses. And, and, and yet this is something people still don't want to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful conversation. So well done. Please hop on anybody uh, for a question. Uh, Mark has his hand up. Hand up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, uh, Frank, I just I don't really have the words, but thank you um, for for doing this and 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 be willing to share your story. Um, you know, it, I, you know, and, and I'd love to hear Matt and Ryan. You talked about this a little bit earlier, but the amazing experience that, like, you know. Um, when we made our film, I mean, it changed my life in ways that I just didn't see coming. Um, I, I think, I mean, one of my favorite things in the world is to get to know people that like normally my life's path wouldn't cross with. Um, and I just felt like ridiculously blessed. Um, you know, I was fascinated by the story we made, I was, you know, but I was overwhelmed emotionally by the amount of trust that we were given that we, I felt we didn't deserve. <laughs> um, and um, that changed me in a way that I just never saw coming. Um, and it just touches so much upon what you guys are talking about, um, how much actually we can do for each other if we find a way to build that bridge. Um, it, it just, it feels so hard. Um, you know, I just, you know, in, in our, in our experiences, listening to John, the, 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 um, the main subject in our film talk, um, do so many Q and A's and, you know, a lot of the time, the, the vast majority of the crowd is civilians. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, you, you, you know, you, you think all these barriers exist, um, and then you realize like, you know, with some, you know, with the kind of courage that people like Frank show, you know, they can come down in ways that I guess you just, you know, 
I, I just be, you know, I, I'd love to hear what uh, from Matt and Ryan a little bit about what that was like for them um, to kind of experience that. Um, you know, like they said, they're not veterans. I'm not a veteran. I grew up a military brat. My dad was always my hero, but I was disconnected from that world for a lot of emotionally to the, for the most part. Right. I knew that was part of my identity, but it wasn't much more than that. Um, yeah. I mean, Mark, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The thing is like, y'all try to go, everyone tries to go through life open-minded and, you know, willing to accept and it's harder than we think it is. And then, you know, when we met Frank, I think we instantly connected kind of on a spiritual level. Like there was just something there um, that was just beyond, you know, what he, what we were talking about doing, which was the personal connection there that I think we both liked, well, all three of us liked. And um, we, we never saw, like you said, you never saw it coming. We never saw our relationship growing the way it did. I mean, we're really, I say we're best friends, we're family, we love each other. You know, we text each other yeah. all hours of the night for all different yeah. things. And, Same and, thing on my end, yeah. And it was for me going into it, like, you know, you all, every, every project you go into, you take your own personal perspective. So for me at the time, I mean, it's something that I've always dealt with in my life was just sort of like, you know, socially unwilling to like go out there and be, you know, in, you know, and being anxious and, you know, social situations and, and a lot of that stuff just closed me off to ever wanting to try or just like push myself out there and like, you know, little things like that, you know, and, and when you start seeing what Frank's dealing with, what some of these people are dealing with, you see the bravery and the courage of the honesty, um, just like accepting that issue and then working to make it better, you know, if you can. Um, at first, it was harder for me, you know, going out there, flying out to Buffalo with the whole Frank and his whole family and a bunch of people I don't know was completely out of my comfort zone. Um, but it was like Frank's throwing himself into this. I'm going to throw myself into this and doing that. Like, really, I mean, it's been my new philosophy of life is open yourself up to things and throw yourself into them. because since then, every time you do that, something positive comes out of it. Or you meet something, you learn an interesting story, you, you find a new perspective on life that you might not have known yesterday. And, you know, Fair if that's not, not growing, if learning every day and experiencing what's out there isn't growing, then, you know, if then, then, then there is no such thing, you know? So for us, it, that's what I took from it was it's how I approach everything I do now. And I, I consciously do think of Frank, you know, how would Frank manage this situation? You know, how would someone, one of these people that we met along the way deal with this problem, you know, deal with, would they get mad at this stupid thing that I shouldn't get mad at? Or should I go out there and do this thing that's gonna be hard, but could be good, you know? Now it's that, that, that positivity, that, that potential of, of something good coming out of it far outweighs that fear of not wanting to, to put yourself out there and try. So that's my perspective personally on it as a non-veteran issue and not being a veteran myself. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, you know, when you meet someone, you know, it's very easy to rush to judgment. Like, there was one veteran that we met um, that came to Frank uh, right before that family day. It was actually in that, on that morning and he came wearing a mask and he was clearly uh, suffering from trauma, post-trauma. And, um, and, you know, Frank obviously dealt with him very empathetically, but when you start to understand that, um, that you know, you may see someone on the street, and they may be either homeless or or just you know having issues. And you know, instead of walking by that person and just ignoring them, maybe you know acknowledge them in some way, or or just at least to yourself acknowledge that uh, you know you understand that that person might be dealing with something, as opposed to just ignoring them. Um, and the other thing I I think that you know resonates is that idea of sharing and and talking about something that you know that that deals with mental health. I, personally, I have a son that, um, that uh, is on the autism spectrum and he's dealing with a lot of mental health issues um, like ADHD and ODD. And I think previous to meeting Frank, I was like, you know, something, it was something I didn't talk about. I, I, I you know, I, I didn't know how to talk about it. And after hearing Frank, you know, be so free and, and open with his mental health issues and the things he's dealt with, I think, uh, it's opened me up to understanding that there's no shame in talking about it. And when you start to talk about it, you find that not only is it relieving for yourself to get it off your chest, but then you might find someone who could offer you some help, you know, or, or give you some advice or just, uh, you know, just hear your story. And that's helpful. So personally, I found, I found that to be true. Especially for young kids, it's, it's that idea of feeling different, you know, and something I have to keep hidden from my friends. You know, if you don't have to feel that way, it's 
like you said, other illnesses, you don't say, you're, you know, you got to go to the doctor to take care of this. It's like, if it could become that kind of thing, then, then that's, you know, that's our goal. You know, in counseling, they do say that we heal in healthy community. And so the more people isolate because of their trauma, it, it's just this, this cycle, isn't it? This spiral trajectory. If we start isolating in the time that we need to connect, it just spirals and get worse. And if, or if we take that trauma and we can connect in a healthy community, healthy community, um, or people on that trajectory, um, what an incredible support and way to heal again. Um, so yeah, love the conversation because I think that is again, the antidote. And it's for PTSD. And I think it encompasses all mental health issues as well. Um, I'll jump in. I don't really have like thoughts that I, you know, like well thought out thoughts, but I just want to thank you, the three of you for making this film. And I feel like there's something frank about even a Vietnam veteran doing this, where I feel like there was so much, um, I mean, animosity towards veterans when you, when you guys came back. And then also back then, like now I think, feel like PTSD is more spoken about, but back then it just was not. So for you to lead this charge and put yourself out there and be vulnerable allows others um, in, in that generation and beyond to be vulnerable too. And I think you saw that on your walk, people coming up to you and telling their stories. Um, you know, Sarah mentioned earlier that I did, I did a talk around my, my refugee story and I did it really like for, to honor my mom and my dad. And it was almost a selfish thing to do. But in telling the story, what I realized after the fact, which I'm sure the three of you have seen too, is not for us, right? It's for everyone else and the impact you're making. And the impact you're making, you know, when after I told my story, one of the veterans on, the, on this call mentioned his, his, his uncle, who was a Vietnam vet who had committed suicide. And he said to me, this, yeah, my story could have made a difference for him. And I'm telling you, your story made a difference for me. And I'm sure, and like not even being a vet, right? Being a child of a, my dad was a, was a, was a colonel in the South Vietnamese Air Force. You know, not only did he lose his ranking and his country, but he lost his country too. And hearing your children speak, like that's my experience of my dad, right? The anger he felt and not really understanding him. So just in this short hour, you've given me so much understanding of my father who just recently passed. So I thank you for that. Um, and this whole idea of just, I'm just thinking this whole, there's a call I attend on, um, and a lot of people on this call attend it too, it's called Angels 14, nine o'clock is a veteran and allies call as well. And the guy who runs that always says this, he says, every act of kindness has a ripple effect with no logical ending. And that's what you've created, right? You have like, there's so many lives and so many people you're going to affect with this film. You have no idea. So thank you. Thanks, Vaughn. And to add what you said about the Vietnam veteran thing, I mean, you know, Frank talks about it as being the generation that came after the greatest generation that, you know, was honored for the war and, and really was not, you know, they wouldn't, those, that, those people didn't share their feelings. It was, they, they brought a flask to work and drank their drink. Right. Anyway. Um, you know, so I think the Vietnam veterans sort of kicked that door open um, in the mental health community for, you know, how to sort of look at this differently and what actually is going on. And, and I know Frank, you could probably speak to that better than me. Well, I think um, if you, without, without feeling sorry for the Vietnam veteran, that is, you know, the Vietnam veteran was spit on, I was spit on. And, and basically we went underground. So an entire generation of men went underground and hid their feelings and emotions for two decades. And it had to happen. It was almost the perfect storm to create PTSD. If it wasn't for this, we wouldn't have that. So if it was almost the perfect storm of the veteran going underground, the veteran being exiled, the, the, the suppressing your feelings and emotions, coming after the greatest generation where man up, you know, you know, be a man. And, and that type of attitude that came from my, my father and, and their generation. And so we went underground. And what emerged is, is what we have this beautiful PTSD today. And what we have is, you know, this, this wonderful thing that we call post-traumatic stress disorder. So, you know, it's, it, there was a reason for it. I love that perspective shift, Frank. And going back, uh, I, I travel a lot and, uh, 
and I meet a lot of people. And just a, a quick refugee story. I, I, I was a, I was a speaker, but then they had a guest speaker after me, and it was this Vietnamese lady, and she had two small children. And um, at 11 years old, during the fall of Saigon, her father pushed her through the embassy gates. She was the very last person to, on that infamous flight to freedom, that last helicopter to leave the embassy roof. She, this child, this 11-year-old girl, without a family, the, the, the crowd hoisted her up, all the way up to the top of the building, threw her on this helicopter, and she was on the very last helicopter to leave Vietnam uh, and during the fall of Saigon. And here she is, the guest speaker, and I get to meet her. And like, like I'm crying now. I broke down in tears. It, it was just an amazing, you know, the journey. And, and we also have to realize there's, there's someone else, you know, we're at war, but there, there are people that we're shooting at that are shooting back at us. I mean, there's, there are other people that, that, you know, we don't know that, that, you know, we're going through the same thing only on their side of, of the trench. And, um, and it's interesting once it's all over. And when I went back to Vietnam and to meet the most gracious, wonderful people in the world that I tried to kill and that they tried to kill me, it, it's just, it, there's no words for it. Yeah, if, if I may, uh, gentlemen, first of all, thank you so much for bringing awareness uh, to this. This is so important. Um, there's so much going to my head. I, as a Marine and combat veteran, you know, my experience is so different than the experience of the Vietnam veteran, or as to your point, Frank, what the, the veterans of the greatest generation went through. My grandfather was a Marine. He fought in Tarawa. And growing up, he would tell stories about the Marine Corps, but he never talked about the, the hard things. Uh, they just didn't do it, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the tough guy thing. It wasn't until I became a Marine that he actually shared some of his stories, some of his combat stories, and they were horrific. And when you looked at him, you, you never knew that that was going on in, in his mind. That he was experiencing his things and he, he didn't have anyone to talk to. You know, he just dealt with it. I remember seeing a couple of years ago, a, a video about Marines that returned to, it was either Wake Island or Guadalcanal. I, I, I apologize, I can't remember, but when they were there on the island, they were thinking through and realized how blessed they were that they had the lives that they had, that they had lived this long to come back to that battleground and to see that now because of folks like you, the awareness that there is post-traumatic stress, they were thinking, what the hell is wrong with me? I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be thinking these things. I shouldn't be feeling these things. I've got a problem. They didn't understand. And it wasn't until these later years in life that they started to understand and that they had the ability to talk to people to, you know, it, it matters when people are willing to listen, when they create that space, like to your point, as you've talked about, you know, uh, for me coming back from Iraq, people were so gracious, it was a very different time. And I would always tell my Marines and sailors, you have to understand how important this is because the guys and gals that came back from Vietnam, they didn't get this different time in history. There's a lot of things that went into why things happened the way they did back here at home. And if somebody thanks you for their service, you know, that's something people talk about now. What I told my guys was be thankful that somebody's thanking you for your service. They may not know what to say. You know, they may not have anybody in the military. They might, you know, it's just not their world. That's the way our system's set up. People now volunteer, they're not drafted. When you come back and somebody offers a welcome home, if it happens 30,000 times, every time act like it's the first time somebody is welcoming you home. 
because that's how much it matters. Frank, you are so blessed. You know, you've been through so much, but you are so blessed that you've come to this point in your life, that you've had this reckoning with your heart, your soul, your mind, and especially with your kids. That's, that's a huge blessing because not everybody has that, right? Uh, being able to have your kids come back to you and, and connect with those things and, and to tell you, hey, we love you. It's okay. We, now we understand. This is tremendous work. I thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and like you said, it's just the talking about it. I mean, you know, we, we went back to St. Albans, which was the hospital where Frank was treated for months after he was, after he was flown back from, uh, from, I think, Japan is where you initially went, right, Frank? Yeah. Um, so we went back to St. Albans and spoke to the head of mental health there. And I mean, the one, number one thing he said was just, there's so much evidence that just speaking about it leads to successful treatment, you know? So if it will just get people to talk about it. So we went back, we went back and we kind of retraced uh, my military career. So, you know, from Vietnam, um, I went to Japan after I, I was uh, wounded. And then from there, worked my way back to St. Albans in New York City. Uh, that's my home city. And, um, and so that's where I spent most of my recovery, almost a year there. And, um, and so we, went, we kind of went back and followed followed the journey and interviewed people, you know, in these places that, uh, where I, I had once, uh, been, it was kind of fun. Hey, Frank, um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this in a way, how important, because it's, it's, it's layered. How important was it for you and impactful for you that people were listening to the stories and how is it, how important is it for them that you took the time to share your story? I mean, what would, it's kind of like when people share, when they hear your story, they get to carry it with them and you don't have to carry it alone kind of thing. So I'm just asking that how important was it to you and impactful to you that they would hear your story and how important do you think it was and impactful to them that they got to hear your story? There, there's a part of the film when I reach, when I reach New York City, there's a part of the film where I'm on the George Washington Bridge and I, and I carried an American flag throughout the whole state and I stopped traffic on the George Washington Bridge. And my only thought was, now they're paying attention to me. You know, like I had to walk across New York State. I've been talking for 30 years on my own to a limited audience. I can only travel so much. And, you know, I was a one man army, uh, so to speak. And so it was, I, I, would, I would get a good response and people would listen to me, but it was limited. And, and so, you know, I felt, I felt up against it. I felt, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm 73 now, as I'm getting older, you know, I don't have much time left. And people, I needed people to pay attention. And once I stood on the George Washington Bridge and realized they stopped. I was on the front page of Newsday, New York Newsday, and I stopped traffic and the people, you know, they're listening to me. That, you know, people just wanted me to say something. And it, it, they started to listen. It was a burden, that weight I've been carrying for 50 years, that weight, that burden that I had been carrying myself um, that someone is paying attention to me now and someone is listening to my story now. And it's, it's not so much about myself. It's a universal story. It's a soul. It's, it's the story of, of mental health. It's not my story. It's our, it's our story. It's human being. It's the human spirit story. And, and someone is now paying attention to me. And so it was worth all my years of suffering, the moment that happened. And it was worth everything that I had put into this. You know, this, the film now is five years for me. I'm working on this one project for five years, but I've been working on PTSD for 30 years. And now it's coming together. And so it's so much worth it. When on, on the flip side, 
when I sat there, I learned something very important on this walk. I learned to listen. It's so, so important. Just sit there and be quiet and listen. And I have, I like to talk. And I had, a, I had a trouble with that in the beginning. And, but I learned to listen. And it was so important for people to unload. And, you know, it was part of me. I was absorbing their bad energy, too. I mean, it, was, it wasn't easy. You know, every time someone would tell me their traumatic story, I would relive my own trauma. And so, you know, I was a pincushion, so to speak. So, you know, but that's what I chose. I chose to do that. And so it was, it was that importance that was transferred from my head to their head was the same. I felt it. I felt that, that the way I felt standing on the GW bridge and, and people paying attention to me was how they felt when they unloaded their story. It, it's, it's exponentially, I can't find the words to tell you how gratifying, important, and life-fulfilling it is. You know, I could die tomorrow and I feel that, I, I, I fulfilled my, my destiny and, and um, I got the message out there and it was all about the message. We, we got to see Frank heal along the way. I mean, we, he, you know, from the beginning, he kept saying, this is about healing as much as it is about educating and stuff. It's about healing myself by doing this. And I think by, you know, we talked about it being so sparse in the beginning by starting slow, it was really hard for him to get going. There was no one to reach out to. By that time we got to the GW bridge, we had me hit so many schools we really did feel like it was a culmination of watching this man go through this healing process himself. And, and that was quite amazing. Yeah, you talked about the, uh, the contagious uh, aspects of it. Uh, my granddad, um, World War I, able-bodied seaman, the hardness and impact on my dad and my dad in World War II uh, on a battle-hardened uh, heavy cruiser uh, coming back and that transferring to me and then me on my children. And now I see my children having some of those same negative impacts on their children. And um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it does, I mean, nobody gets out of this thing unbruised, you know. It's, you know There's no winners. You know, yeah. I've been, the, the conflict has no winners. There are no winners. I don't care what side you're on. Yeah, and it is the, it's, I mean, in all of this, all of this is the, the high cost of, of war, not just on the person who is in the war, but every person that that person is around, uh, related to. I mean, there are some high costs of war uh, that, that, that transfer generationally. Uh, I know that my dad was not able to talk about, he talked about his liberty and the fun stuff along the way. But then after I'd been in the Navy for a year, few years, he was able to talk about the, the hard stuff for me. And I never saw my dad weep, except for when I would leave to go on some sort of an engagement and uh, to go play over there in the North Atlantic. Um, now, for that, how important do you think it might be for young military to hear this at the very beginnings of their career to prepare for their life. I, what, are you, what are your thoughts about that? I've been, I, I've, been advocating, I've been advocating for 30 years about education. I believe we're, we're a society that waits for somebody to get hit by a car and then we put up a stop sign. You know, yeah. and, and, and so my approach and is then, being, and then name a name a law around that person that got killed. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. OK, so so what I've been doing, my my curriculum, the experience of the American soldier in high schools. So so I believe, you know, my vision is to have this film go along with that curriculum and, and be mandatory viewing for every high school student in America. You know, this is the reality. 
And so reality-based education has been what I've been advocating for for 30 years. So that said, now I, I had now have teachers that were in my program 20 years ago that now have been using my curriculum and they're teachers now and they're teaching their students. So if we could set up an education program about mental health, about PTSD, and, and my, ed, my program does that and talk about it at the educational level, it, prepare yourself. This could happen to you. And, and by the way, you know, son or, you know, daughter, uh, you don't have to go to war to be traumatized. You go, you're going you're gonna to experience trauma in your life. Uh, you know, get hit by a car, the death of a loved one, you know, a, a pandemic. There's so many things that can happen to you. So let's let's talk reality at the educational level. So I think it's so important that we should have this conversation before they go into the military. And part at the end of the film, I actually talk with another veteran about, you know, if if young people knew what we knew, would, would it put a dent in recruiting? Would it really hurt recruiting? Well, maybe so. But maybe we should change our approach, change our approach to education, change our approach to mental health and change our approach to war. And so, you know, it's it would be it changed the whole picture. It would change everything. Right. I mean, I think back to my earliest parts of my career, back when they first invented the Navy, um, that. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, but I but. The people that were put before me as a young sailor talked about the grit and the glory. They didn't talk about the grime. Right. You know, they they right. didn't prepare me for the ugliness that was going to have to come out of me in order to be successful at my job. Uh, I, I mean, I had it felt like it was being hidden and I had to deal with it on my own. It was 20 years uh, carrying around heavy burden before I had my and I mean it was I mean it was a white knuckle hang on to everything before I would walk in you yeah. talk about that first step yeah. um, but it's yeah, an uphill, I, yeah it's an uphill yeah. fight and I personally have I I take offense and I have a problem with Hollywood and I have a problem with how they how they glorify the act of war as opposed to you know you know, it, how it's been done from the from the Rambo right up until, you know, to today and then and video games and how how you, you know, you get a certain amount of points for killing people. You know, we need to we need to change the conversation and, and you know, and we need to talk about this in real terms when and with real people at, like you, like me and say, hey, wait a minute, you need to listen to this first. OK, it's then also everyone's you different. Everyone's got their own way. And that's the only other thing we found on the walk is that even two people may have experienced the same trauma. Frank talks about one of his uh, one of his um, friends who he, he um, served with all through till the end. And, uh, you know, they both had a very similar experience and have to very different approaches to how they deal with it now in their lives. So you realize everyone's, you know, even similar situations are going to have different process going on in their brain and how they're how they're dealing with this thing. There's no one blanket approach to how we, how do we, how do we, you know, solve this problem? Yeah, I certainly, or certainly agree with that. It's, it's just that when, when my sons went into the military, I started talking to them at the beginning of that yeah. and saying, it's going to be mostly chores and gutting through stuff. Um, and um, it's not all glamour. And, and having lived with me, I think they realized that, you know, it's like, <laughs> the, you know what I mean? I, 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 I could just pick up for one second, sorry, Frank. Go ahead, yeah, go. go. Ahead. No, no, sorry about that. I just wanted to add to what you guys were saying from a different angle. And um, so first of all, Frank, thank you so much for all the work that you've done for yourself and in turn for others. And uh, Matt and Ryan for for allowing Frank to be able or giving him a platform to tell this story through your empathetic lens is, is freaking awesome. Uh, um, but one thing that I wanted to add was, well, I'm not a veteran. I'll, I'm a career police officer who recently retired. So much of this resonates with my own experiences from a different viewpoint. Um, the signs and symptoms are, are, are so similar when you're talking about your experiences overseas and fighting a battle and 
where what we're doing here at home, not necessarily where I was working, but in, in some of the more urban centers, we talk about Chicago, parts of New York, LA, um, and where you guys were bringing the stories home after a couple of years worth of military service in these foreign countries, so many police officers are bringing these stories home every day for a course of 25 or 30 years. Yep. And so when you're talking about how these uh, stressful, the, your own post-traumatic stress is then transferred into your family uh, through your own signs and symptoms and, and bring that towards your family. Um, so many of our nation's law enforcement here on, on our own soil are bringing these stories and these feelings and these emotions every day into their home in real time and how it's affecting their marriages, their children. And then when you, as you were just talking about sending that uh, Papa Ryan, as we were saying, talk about sending that down the line generationally, um, those are, are emotions and pent up feelings that were never discussed and coming out as um, either violence or anger or alcohol and drugs. Um, we have police officers in our country today that are dealing with it in real time and dealing with this traumatic response at the same time while they're working. And I think I, I love what you've done with your story. And I would love to see if we could find a way to do the law enforcement story as a parallel. Um, and I think it would be such a compliment to, to all the things that you've done and all the great work you've done and um, how it affects the daily families. Our media is not telling the story of, of law enforcement. And we've had this discussion on our calls. And frankly, you just said about Hollywood, the glorification of law enforcement through the, the current shows, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the Chicago shows or whether it's uh, the rookie um, SWAT, like all of these shows that are coming out that are out now, glorifying police work in, in the same vein that the, um, the media is saying is terrible. So we're sending out all of these mixed signals. And then my kids would be like, dad, what, what the hell is going on here? Right. And how do I explain it to them through my own emotions and my own thoughts in a way that's comprehensible to them? And then they go to school and their kids ostracize them. My one kid got called a racist because his dad's a cop. Right. Like, it, how do you, to try to reconcile all that on a daily ongoing basis over the course of a career is, is you know, is incredible. And um, I just can't thank you enough for your insight and all the stuff that you're doing to, to make this common conversation and um, I, I look forward to the day where law enforcement is included in this same realm that we, we've brought our military to. So thank you for all of it. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. And I, they yeah. are, I would like to just real quick add, you know, one of the scenes we, we were invited when we came over the GW Bridge, we were invited into a Harlem um, precinct community center. And, you know, we did get to see the perspective of law enforcement. And it's, you know, what, what the thing that grabbed us was that it's, of course, not what you see on the news or in movies. I mean, here was police working with community in Harlem to find out what's going on in their community, listening to each other, working together to find out the problems and, and find a solution to it. And that was something that really, really inspired us. And it was one of the few communities around the city that really did welcome us in inside the doors and give us a look at what's happening you know on the ground level between you know and it's all related i mean mental illness race police communities i mean it's all intertwined so it is in the film and i think those stories are par parallel and you know we would love to you know you know help you know get that message out too about you know mental throughout illness. throughout um throughout new york state i worked with the state troopers um, of course, walking and, and I, two years before the walk, I set everything up with the state troopers. I met with them, had private conversations. How many troopers came to me privately and said, you know, they're dealing with post-trauma. They're dealing, they're dealing with these issues and they can't get help because they get their gun taken away. They get their badge taken away. They, there's that stigma. Um, and, and so and they also it, pulled you aside. They didn't say it in front of their fellow officers. Oh, no. Oh, no. They pulled me aside. Everything was hush hush. And they would but they would confide in, in, in me. One one quick story. We we we're filming kind of illegally on a military base and we get surrounded. Our camera crew and myself get surrounded by loaded AR-15s and, and security was surrounding us, pointing with with you know, the safety off and, and they took our cameras and wanted to know what the hell we're doing and what we're filming. And before it was over and I told them what I was doing and who I was and what we were doing, uh, they, 
they start confessing. I well, I was I was at the psychiatrist yesterday, and you know I have PTSD. I couldn't work uh, all last week because I had a breakdown. This is a guy with a loaded AR-15 with the safety off that's talking to us, asking and, for a card, and asking for a card so he can connect with me, so he can have a conversation, continue the conversation with me. And and Matt had his um, uh, audio on. And we have the whole, we had the, we, we recorded the whole conversation, even yeah. though they took our cameras, the recording was still going and the guy's confessing. And there's a guy with a loaded, you know, AR-15. Um, we didn't use it, obviously, in the film, but no, it was one of those I, moments like, that know, just hit us, like the reality of it. That we the reality about. of it, of like, it's everywhere, it, you know. It's everywhere, and 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 uh, and. David, more where were you an officer? I, I'm right outside in Jersey, right outside Manhattan as well. I'm just curious. Uh, I'm I live down in Hopewell. I worked in East Windsor. Oh, okay. so we're exit eight on a turnpike. Okay, I'm up higher. I've been Weehawken, right outside the city. Okay. Hey, hey David, uh, you just planted something in my brain that that I'm I'm amazed and at how ignorant I was at something. And, and just unaware, uh, two things is, is you're going to the, f law enforcement is going to the fight every day and coming home, well, metaphorically every night, it could be their working night coming home during the day. Uh, and then almost an image of what I see in the world today, in our, in our world today, is law enforcement is the Vietnam, excuse me if this rubs the wrong way but law enforcement is the vietnam vet of the day in terms of that being treated with with vile and disregard uh and and that's no that's not making them the same thing but it is the same impact and it's every day not going away and then coming back so yeah uh, thanks for uh fixing my brain on that well, I would like to add to that, that uh, Van had said that to me uh, a couple of weeks back. She, I forget what, um, which call we were on, but you had mentioned that in, in reference to comparing today's law enforcement to the Vietnam veterans of, you know, the, the mid seventies returning home. And I had never made that connection before until she had said something. And I, I gotta be honest with you. And, and I think I sent you a message about it as well. I haven't stopped thinking about it over the last couple of weeks. And it, it, I literally wake up thinking about it and go to sleep thinking about that conversation. And uh, there's gotta be a way that that message and that correlation, that connection can be publicly addressed in a way that communicates with um, the rest of the world, what we're doing to our, the people that are protecting our communities. And I say it in the context of a grandchild of Holocaust survivors where their big, the big phrase is never again. And um, if we are looking back on how awful that was for the people that came home from Vietnam, why are we doing it again? And if that message, and I'm not the person I'm not trying to suggest it at all, that if we as a community, as a group or somebody can get that connection publicly recognized, I. I so important and thank you for even and, and verbalizing that because it's something that I've been thinking about for weeks now since she has said it uh, to me and, and it's, it's an right. incredible concept. Well, I am so glad that you're here also, David, because I think in my mind, law enforcement military, we think about the whole realm of protection. We think about how you are trained and wired to suffer in silence, to stuff because you have to do this job where you can't be all in your feelings. And yet there's no training in the toolbox, whether it's you know for law enforcement or for military boot camp, they don't talk about um, how to express your feelings. Right. So after you get out or after or while in law enforcement, since you're getting traumatized, probably well, you potentially traumatized every day, you, you see traumatic events every day. And like I hear from so many police officers, you're OK until you're not. And so that's the end. That is the part that we aren't addressing. That's the part why these these conversations are so powerful. I'm so glad you're here, David. 
I'm so glad that you are the voice of also uh, the protectors of the law enforcement officers too. And I'm also thinking too, with all these conversations, I know you want to say something, David, so I want to make sure you hop in. It was a thank you. It was a thank you. That's all. Oh, it's, I, I, it's so great. I keep thinking the more all, you know, with the, the, the power of our, con, of our story, I cannot tell you every angle that I hear in every stories. And I'm like connecting all these dots. I hear Vaughn's story. I hear David's story. I hear uh, Frank's story, so many others. And I have close friends in the black community who are still struggling with trauma, generational trauma. And I just keep thinking, we all just have to listen to each other. Like Frank says, if we can hear where each other's coming from and why they're feeling so much, we would not be at odds. We, we can't not like our enemy when we see them close up, right? When we start hearing their stories. And um, I've been also deeply touched by David uh, sharing, and not only is he a retired police officer, um, but again, that half of his family, his grandparents were victims of the Holocaust and half uh, were protected, who were, you know, uh, strangers brought them to this country. And that's why David's here today. So um, again, it's just, it's powerful, powerful to hear people's stories. I have learned so much of the, uh, you know, over the last few years, I, I cannot even tell you. So again, thank you so much. And it, does anybody have any last statements, questions, thoughts? Well, we'll be, we'll, <laughs> I'll speak. Uh, we're premiering the film uh, June 30th in New York City. And uh, we're very excited. Uh, that's our, that, that'll be our premiere. That'll be the first time it's out in public. And uh, then we're in Orlando, Florida, and we're out to Denver, Colorado. So uh, hopefully we'll make our way to the West Coast and come and visit you. Yes, yes, so we're also <laughs> yes. <laughs> We'll have coffee. I'll set up a party. We'll have coffee and conversation. Yeah, that's right. We'll make it extra special. So, <laughs> um, before, I, I, before, 